story of Joseph is a biblical example of God's providence. The scripture reading this morning is taken from Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 8. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near, then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Please be seated. God has been with you. It is also that alternative. 
that we would call Pentecostal. And Pentecostalism is the idea that God is acting on everything, everywhere, all the time. They see miracles in everything. Every, every uh, breath that someone takes is a miracle. They see a miracle behind every corner. And they attribute everything, good or bad, to the activity of God. And they do not fool people, then therefore as responsible for their choices, because they believe that God favors and punishes people all the time, individually and at every step. Providence is the idea that is somewhere between those two. Yes, God is involved in the affairs and activities of people. But God is not the one who pulls the string, so to speak. God has not forced people to become robots or puppets. But God is His infinite wisdom. God in His love for us in creating us in His image. God has intended something, and therefore He is at work, and through all things, they work together for that good. Now, let me remind you of three quick things about God so that you understand how this providence, we can talk about it, how it works. Number one, God is never inconsistent with his own nature. Our God is holy. In Isaiah 6, 3, there the angels describe, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. God is holy. He is pure. He is perfect. There is no inconsistency within God. God cannot and nor does he tempt anyone to do evil. Think about it. That's against God's nature. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Mercy and truth go before his face. Psalm uh, 89, 14. Understand, God is always perfect, holy, just. God is never inconsistent with his own nature. Secondly, God's foreknowledge does not negate the free will of man. We look sometimes into the accounts in Scripture, and particularly maybe we think of a few examples like the Pharaoh that God raised up, and it says that the Lord hardened his heart. Or maybe we think of something that, like the Sanhedrin when they crucified Jesus, that these things were so predetermined that those individuals have no free will or choice of saying that. Saying that that's not true. And I'll try to show you that today as we go through this, but understand something that when we see that they have a responsibility, we have a responsibility. We have the ability to choose. And we must listen to understand God so that we can make those choices. When you think about Caiaphas' statement in John 11 50, he said, It's expedient for one man to die so that the whole nation will not perish. Well, Caiaphas said that, and of course, that's almost prophetic in the sense that Jesus does die, not for the nation, but for all mankind. Jesus' death came and proved the end of the very purpose and point that God has called Israel to be his people in the first place. Thirdly, providence must be distinguished from the miraculous. Simple example, Mary had never known a man. She was a virgin. Her conception was what we call immaculate. That is, it was from the Holy Spirit. Mary had not known a man. She didn't know it, so that's miraculous. Back in 1 Samuel chapter 1, there was a woman by the name of Hannah. Hannah, Hannah had her womb closed. She had not had a child. She prayed that God would give her a child. It says there in verses 16 and 20 that her husband, Elkanah, knew her. That is, they had the normal marital relationship by which conception took place. God providentially provided her, but that was not miraculous. That was through the normal and natural processes of a husband and a wife conceiving a child. When we talk about providence, what probably shocks people most of all is that it is both provable and non provable. Probably you just said, Terry, that's about the most double speak. You know, what does that mean? Well, providence is provable as we look through Scripture. That is, we know and we see the overall working of God, how God brings things together, and therefore we can attribute that to God. 
providence is not provable in the sense that in everyday events of your life and mine, we may or may not know whether those things are something that God is working. But what we do know is this. I don't want anybody's face to, to shatter or crumble. But what I want you to understand is that providence is not provable, but what we know is the promise of God, and that is what Paul said in Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. So even if something that may seem bad, all right, listen to me, something that may seem painful, hurtful, troubling, something that may seem that has no sense, a great purpose in your life can still work out for good because it is God who is over us. And it is God who through all these things if we allow Him, if we choose Him, walk by faith, God can provide those things providence in our life. The idea of providence is from a Latin word that means foresight or to see before. God who sees and knows all things, gives us this. Go read for us from Genesis chapter 45. I want us to take the life of Joseph and quickly go through it as a test case. Recently, I was reading a book that Brother Henry Story had written from Egypt to Bethlehem. And in looking at this book, he referred to a sermon preached back in 1893 by J.W. McGarvey. And I realized when I, when I read that on the page, I had that book. I have a book of McGarvey's sermons, and I went to it, and sure enough, that sermon was there. And I enjoy very much reading, but I appreciate that Brother Hillary's mention of that and tying that into his uh, writing. And Brother McGarvey, back in 1893, used the life of Joseph to talk about the providence of God. I want you to think about this story of the life of Joseph uh, with you. You remember that Abraham was called by God. And before we get to Joseph, look with me at Genesis chapter 15. Abraham is called by God. He's given promises that he will become great, that his seed or his uh, children will become, his descendants, excuse me, will become like the stars of the heavens or the sand of the seashore, that they will be innumerable. And he has promised that his descendants will live in the land that God has brought him to at that particular time. In Genesis 15, look to what God says, verses 13 to 16, about this particular uh, land and what is going to happen to his descendants in between now, the time of Abraham's life, and the time that they would subject the land. In Genesis 15, the beginning of verse 13, then he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will save them, and they will afflict them. Four hundred years. After the nation whom they said, I will go. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So there, God tells Abraham, Your descendants are going to go to a foreign land. A land that does not belong to them, and in that land they're going to be afflicted. I'm sure that Abraham was, was bothered by that, but what Abraham knew already in his own life was that God was good. And God's plan is good. And so Abraham took heart in the fact that if God is the one who is telling him this, then God will use this for good. Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac has two sons. He saw Jacob. Jacob is the one that God chooses to be that, be that uh, descendant to and lineage for the seed. Jacob has 12 sons. And you remember the 11th son, the firstborn son of his beloved wife, Rachel. His name is Joseph. And Joseph is Jacob's favorite son. He gives him a, a long sleeve coat, a coat that we call of many colors. It had a fringe with many colors in it. It was a coat of honor. This was enough to promote jealousy within his brothers. But then, as a teenager, Joseph had some dreams. And in those dreams, he relates to his brothers and even to his father that 
in those dreams, they all bow down to Joseph. Now, we've already got a little bit of sibling rivalry. That goes in front. And for Joseph to forget the time when those older brothers, those two older brothers, are going to have to bow down before him, that's just about enough for them. They go and they shepherd and keep the flocks and cattle with their father. Jacob sent Joseph about 60, 70 miles away to check him to go check on them. And when they see him coming, the brothers that they can't even speak, civilly speak, they say, let's get ready. Let's kill him. They end up throwing him into a well or a pit, a dry well, and he goes down there. Reuben, the oldest figure, he'll come back around and be able to, to rescue him and, and get him back home somehow. In the meantime, Judah said, why should we kill him and not get anything out of it? Let's show him. Here comes the Ishmaelite, the traveling band of salesmen. We'll show him to them, and they can take him and make him a slave in some foreign country. Joseph is sold for 20 pieces of silver and to Egypt. He's purchased there by a man named Potiphar. Works in Potiphar's house. Potiphar, because he's successful, Potiphar puts him over his whole house. He's in charge of everything except basically Potiphar's wife. Potiphar's wife tries to seduce Joseph. She throws herself at him. He resists, refuses, runs away. She keeps his coat in the process, but she's able to make an accusation. Potiphar, clearly knowing the character and integrity of Joseph, and also his wife, is torn and has Joseph placed in jail when he could have had him put to death. Joseph ends up in prison. He works there. Again, he's successful. God's hand is with him. He's put over all the prisoners. Two officers from Pharaoh's house come, a butler and a baker. They have dreams. Joseph interprets those dreams. The butler is restored to his position. The baker loses his head. Literally. He dies. The butler says he'll remember Joseph, but he forgets. For two years, he's working back in Pharaoh's house, and Joseph is stuck, still in that prison. But Pharaoh's going spend the rest of his life. Pharaoh has a dream. Actually, a couple of dreams. The brother remembers his fault, tells the Pharaoh that there's a man there in prison named Joseph who can interpret dreams. They go get Joseph, clean him up, bring him to the Pharaoh. He interprets the dream. The Pharaoh hears the wisdom of Joseph and says, you know what? There are going to be seven years of plenty, good harvest, and there's seven years of famine. We need somebody to prepare and plan for this. And who better than a man of such wisdom and gifted by God to be able to help us in this endeavor? And so Pharaoh is God's choice to second ruler in all the land of Egypt. Seven years of good, plenty come along. They get two years into the famine. Jacob and his sons are starving. And so in Genesis 42, by the way, Joseph has married. He has two sons. The first son he named Manasseh. And he names him that because Manasseh means forgetful. Forgetful. Oh, he's not talking about Manasseh. What he's saying is God has caused me to forget the loss of my family to disconnect here in a foreign land. That explains Ephraim comes along and it is fruitful. In other words, God has blessed me bountifully here in the land of Egypt. Up in the land of Canaan, Jacob and his sons are starving. Joseph looks at his ten old, his ten sons, the one older than Joseph, and says, are, are you going to do nothing? You know, you're going to stand around and look at one another? He sends them to Egypt. Joseph sees them. They do not recognize Joseph because he looks like an Egyptian. The dress, the garb, the hair, the face, shade is different than the way that these shepherds look. They look rough. Joseph looks all clean. They don't recognize him. It's been 20 years. They don't recognize him. Joseph recognizes them and he begins to check them. He finds out about the family, finds out that his father's still alive, finds out that he's got a younger brother that's still alive, Benjamin as well. He gives them their money back, ends up having Simeon and Held uh, to, until Benjamin can be brought. They go home. Of course, Jacob's not going to let Benjamin go, so they run out of food again. They make no choice. They make a promise. They come down. Joseph sees. All these brothers. He sees Benjamin. He's able to see and hear, and that's where here in Genesis 45, he reveals it. I want you to notice, look at this story in three times, there in verse 5 and verse 7 and verse 8. Notice how Joseph attributes how this happened. He said, but now do not go forth be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. 
For God sent me before you to preserve life. Verse 7. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity. Verse 8. So now it was not you who sent me to do, but God. So you look at that and you say, well, wait a minute. Joseph becomes the second ruler. He's able now to bring his whole family down into Egypt and spare them. I mean, what a great opportunity in a time in which they would have otherwise potentially failed. Wiping out the family and stopping the promises that God had made. The angel here, and in his seed, all nations of the earth would be blessed. Genesis 22, verse 10. Abraham had obeyed God's name. What we see here, how did Jacob, uh, how did Jacob become the second ruler in all of Egypt? Well, because he had the interpret the Pharaoh's dream. How did he get to interpret Pharaoh's dream? Well, he'd been a prisoner and met his brother in prison. How did he end up in prison? Well, he was in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife made a false accusation uh, of a sexual assault against him. So how did he end up in Potiphar's house? Well, he was sold as a slave. How did he get sold as a slave? Because his brothers hated him and they wanted to kill him. You look at this, and except for a couple of places where God touches the story in some miraculous way, specifically, Joseph being able to interpret the dreams the dreams of the butler and baker and the dreams of Satan. Other than those two touches, what part of the story was not? Those people acted according to their own desires. They acted out of their own selfish interests. The brothers, Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, the, the guard or captain of the prison, the, the butler, the baker, Pharaoh, every one of them, all of them, they acted according to their normal and natural interests. They chose. They had free will at every step of the way. If you ask yourself, how did this chain become linked together? It's because God uses those individual choices, and through it all, God touches the life of Joseph just enough so that Joseph can be what he needs to be for the purpose that God needed him to be. God saw before him. We could go through the Bible and we could talk about whether it's the life of King David or the life of Esther, or whether it's Jesus or the Apostle Paul, or even a little little known slave, a document in the book of Philemon. We could find dozens of examples of God's providence at work in the lives of people in everyday affairs, in everyday events. And God's purpose is still coming. When you think about the foreknowledge of God, it should cause you to humble believe that God is sovereign of all the universe. When I think about prophecy and when I think about providence, the power of God is seen in every story of the truth. When I think about that point on this day, in no way is God knowing what will happen any that he caused it to happen. God did not cause those brothers to hate. God did not cause Potiphar's wife to want to have a sexual relationship outside of her marriage with Joseph. God did not cause the butler to forget Joseph. That was his own forgiveness. Just like a weather person or, or an astronomer knows when an eclipse is going to happen, or a weatherman predicts rain, and I know they don't get it right all the time, but sometimes they see the, the condition of the weather. And they're able to forecast that. It doesn't mean they caused it to happen. God was able to see and God was able to work through. The freedom that these people possessed was not unlimited, but it was still free. Think about an alcoholic who has given themselves to the desire to drink alcohol. A drug addict who has a desire to use drugs. The more that they use, do they have their freedom? The more that they use, the more they become the more they become empowered and proven by that which they've chosen. Did it start out as a free choice? Yes. No one had to force them to use alcohol and to take drugs, but as they chose it, 
they became responsible for the eventuality, the way in which those choices grew and took power in their lives. When you think about, when you look at other people, do you hold them responsible for their actions? I guarantee you that if you leave here today, God forbid you this should happen after our music is the Lord's station. But if you leave here today and somebody has an accident with you, they run into you, they rear into you uh, on the road, I guarantee you you're going to say, you're responsible for that. How do you view yourself? Are you responsible for your choices? Do you take responsibility for your actions? Or are you always trying to blame somebody else? The only reason I've got to hurt myself is because I'm going to as well. Somebody else said that. We look at ourselves and we have, we have responsibility. You know what? That's the thought. Meaning that we have responsibility. And our morality means that we have an obligation or a duty to do those things that are right. And it cannot keep us from those choices that we should make. So what can we look with me? Something that really becomes relevant. Take your Bible and take over Acts chapter 2. And I am wrapping it up. I promise. In Acts chapter 2, Verse 23, as Peter and the apostles preached on the day of Pentecost, they looked at that audience. The people who were there as Jesus was crucified, and listen to what, they, what Peter said in Acts 2, verse 23. Him, speaking of Christ, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. So it sounds like there that, that Peter is saying, this is God. And this is God's plan. But notice what he says next. You have taken by lawless hands have crucified and put to death. You say, well, to what extent were they responsible? Look over at chapter 3. Look at verses 14 to 17. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. Look at what happened. And killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yet, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brothers, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your leaders. What kind of ignorance? Look at Paul preaching in chapter 13, verse 27, in Antioch of Pisidia. Listen to what Paul says as he talks about that. And again, remember that Paul was one of those who was persecuted. He was one of those who was antagonistic, opposed to the name of Christ. He said in verse 47, Acts 13, For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate, that he should be put to death. What does Peter say? Did they get away with it? They get off the hook? They get away scot free because they did it in ignorance? No, the ignorance was that they didn't take the word of God that the prophets had spoken, and they didn't look at Jesus and say, you know what? He was one of the They didn't put two and two together, as he would say in our vernacular. They didn't look at it honestly. And in fact, what they asked was for a murderer to be released. And what they did was, even though Pilate said three times, I find no fault in him. They said, we don't care. Crucify. Crucify. Oh, no. The people over there that Jesus was crucified, they don't get a free life. They don't get a free pass. They are responsible for their choice. They were wrong. And they bear that responsibility. And that's exactly why in Acts chapter 2. When Peter and the apostles concluded that first full gospel service, when they heard him say that in verse 36, therefore that all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus to be crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They take their responsibility. Yeah. Were they looking for some loophole to say, oh, this was all God's plan? It's his fault. God made a murder. Yeah. No. So, verse 
Joe Sedman. So Peter Sedman. So Joe, and every word you can baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. Before the mention of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They did not know him because they did not listen to the Father. Jesus was the one. God's promise has provided him with a plan. Today, knowing what God did, Will you be a, a Christian, a child of God? Or will you try to get off on some loophole and say, What my fault? I wasn't there. Jesus died for me. Jesus died for me. What does it mean? What does it mean to be a lost sinner? Are you a child of God? Would you be willing to become one by being baptized today? With your life being lived. Art. The artist never does anything to detract from the main feature of person or thing. Perhaps Berkeley, when Pitcher painted a picture of portrait of James the Second, when he painted that portrait of James the Second, he had these glorious tulips in his face. As he had these glorious tulips, they took away the chapter from James the Second's face. He don't. Did the same thing when he had Jesus coming into Jerusalem in triumphant victory. He had the face of the Lord more glorious than the face of Jesus himself. Past the providence of God. That God is the one who is overarching, who is superintending all things. What's the pain in your life? Have you detracted from the glory of Jesus? Or have you let that spread about by the way in which you've made this world? Anyone who needs to pay. Christ away. He knocks at the door, or if he opens, or if he let him in. Right now, all the children are